Our poem today in Lamentations 4 peeks into the city of Jerusalem just a few days before the city falls into the relentless hands of the Babylonian Empire. For more than two years, the Babylonians have laid siege to this city, methodically and cruelly waiting for every last crumb of food, every last drop of water, and every last ounce of humanity to vanish. And as the author zooms into this city in these final days of this siege, the picture is grim, dark, and hopeless. How the gold has grown dim, the poet laments. How the pure gold has changed, the sacred stones lie scattered at the head of every street. And then the poet begins to describe horrors upon horrors upon horrors that are just unimaginable. In verse 4, he continues, the tongue of the infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives them anything. Those who feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple cling to ash heaps. Her princes were purer than snow, he continues, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral, their hair like like sapphire. But now... Their visage is blacker than suit. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. They have become as dry as wood. A city once vibrant in colors of gold and purple and sapphire and coral has now plunged into lifeless gray, covered in soot and ashes. A city once overflowing with floods of water and feasts of delicacy have now withered and evaporated into emptiness and barrenness. A a people once comfortable and thriving have shriveled, their bones as dry as wood, their skin like desert, their tongues so dry words have disappeared." This place, this city, once celebrated and cherished, is crumbled. The people are unrecognizable. So unrecognizable that the prophets and elders who were once celebrated and honored have been scorned, the poet says. Away, unclean, people shouted at the prophets and elders. Away, away, do not touch. And so the prophets and the elders became fugitives and wanderers. It was said among the nations, they, they shall stay here no longer. The Lord himself has scattered them. He will regard them no more. No honor was shown to the priest. No favor to the elders. The, book, the poet continues and says, even the mothers are hardly recognizable as mothers. He writes, the hand of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food and the destruction of my people. And he cries out, my people have become cruel. The city of Jerusalem, a once thriving community, has been replaced by individuals driven by their animalistic instinct to survive just one more day. Their humanity has been robbed from them. They are unrecognizable to themselves, to each other, and to the world around them. And we hear these stories, and it is heavy. It's dark. It's barely even imaginable. And all I want to do as I read Lamentations 4 is to find some shimmer of hope in the edges of this poem, some silver lining that will release some of my discomfort when I hear these stories of cannibalism and loss and dehydration and death. But in Lamentations 4, there is nothing. All there is is terror, grief, devastation, Survival of the fittest. 
And honestly, when I look at all of the horrors that are happening, it's kind of easy for me to see and understand no wonder humanity is lost. War does this. War steals humanity. But I think when we talk about humanity loss, it's important for us to remember, as Dr. Bessel van der Kolk writes in his book, Body Keeps the Score, war is not the only calamity that leaves human lives in ruin. A car accident that leaves us feeling jumpy and defenseless on the highway. A loss of a parent that weighs us down with loneliness and grief. A health scare that leaves us feeling vulnerable and unsafe. The betrayal of abuse at the hands of someone we were supposed to have trusted that leaves us feeling alone, unsafe, weak, and dirty. Toxic relationships that cause us questioning our significance and our worth. The entire year of 2020, for most of us, if not all of us, was a year that was filled with tension between family and friends, terror of a new, unknown, and very dangerous virus, isolation and loneliness from lack of in-person community, and grief from lost loved ones, severed friendships, and a world in political turmoil. In these spaces, we too often experience ruin, whether it be emotional, mental, physical, or spiritual. We become unrecognizable to others, to ourselves, and we find ourselves asking this question over and over and over again. What is wrong with me? Who am I? Over the last year, I have shared with this congregation how difficult it was for me when Joe and I got COVID in November. Joe's case was particularly devastating, and we spent 12... He battled severe and persistent fevers, coughed up blood, battled seizing lungs, and I found myself during these 12 days in my garage trying to hide from Joe the fact that I was crying in terror, in terror because I had no idea if he was going to make it, if I was going to lose my favorite human forever. I have discussed how terror these two weeks were for me, but what I've only somewhat mentioned is how deeply impacted I was even after we had healed and recovered. This was never more pronounced than on Saturday mornings. Now, Saturday mornings are some of my favorite mornings and have always been some of my favorite mornings. Joe and I, we, I mean, it's kind of like a party. We've always, it's been like our favorite day for a very long time. We wake up. It's a day in which we get to do ministry with each community who loves us and who we love in return. We have, it's a day filled with music from Gaither Band and David Phelps and uh, I know I'm throwing some old school names out here. We'll throw in some modern ones. Brilliance and, and a Common Hymnal and all of these things. It's a day filled with music. It's a day filled with creativity. It's a day filled with theological debate and community and lots of good food. For as long as I can remember, Joe and I have loved Saturdays. But after COVID, everything changed. Before, I came into Saturday mornings with a plan, knowing that eventually all of the things would go wrong and it'd be fine, no worries, we'd just pick up and get moving and we'd fix it and roll with the punches. But after COVID, I became absolutely paralyzed by my fear and by my stress for everything. I needed everything to be absolutely perfect. I needed to wake up at the exact right time in the morning. I needed to eat the right thing at the right time in the morning. I needed Joe not to interrupt me at the wrong time in the morning. I needed all of my Zoom calls to be perfectly set up from the camera and the lights and the microphones. Everything had to be perfect. And I was paralyzed by my rigidity and need for control. This went on for a few months. And then in January, we were sitting on our couch watching the live stream of Paradox when all of a sudden it hit me. I had forgotten to include the communion video in the live stream. And my entire world fell apart. 
all of a sudden I was freaking out and seeing red. Oh my gosh, I had failed. I was going to lose the trust of the entire Paradox community. I was going to lose the trust of Craig. I was going to lose my job. I was going to lose my home. I was going to lose Joe. And it didn't matter that Craig was texting me telling me, hey, it's very okay. Mistakes happen. We'll get them next time. It didn't matter that Joe was telling me, the Paradox community loves you. You're, you're not going to lose their trust because you forgot to include a video. It didn't matter. Beyond all reason, I was convinced that my world was ending. And even in my terror, I knew that this wasn't normal. And I started sobbing and I started saying, Joe, what is wrong with me? I don't act like this. I don't react like this. I'm usually someone who can roll with the punches, but here I am freaking out. What is wrong with me? I don't even recognize myself anymore. And Joe very lovingly, wrapped his arms around me and said, let's find you a therapist, which was very lovely. <laughs> we found a therapist. I've been going to her for a really long time. She's magical. If you want a recommendation, I'll give you a recommendation. She's fantastic. Um, but I, did, I went to her, um, and I, I basically poured out everything. And that question, what is wrong with me? was the question that summarized our entire first time together. Finally, she interrupts me and she says, there's nothing wrong with you. What you're experiencing is you're experiencing a trauma response. She goes on to explain that after COVID, I had internalized this myth, that in order to keep my family safe, to keep Joe safe, I had to keep everything under control. And when, inevitably, because life happens, I lost control, my brain went from, oops, I've messed up, to, oh my gosh, I've lost control, to, oh my gosh, I've lost control, and Joe is going to die. It was a very difficult process to work with her. I've been working with her over this last six months, and we, I'm in a much better place right now. Um, I mean, everything went wrong during first service this morning and we handled, it was great, it was fantastic. Um, but it was, it, it was a journey to get past that where I could finally learn to recognize myself again. I think this experience was so important for me because it reminded me in a very vulnerable, very raw, very, uh, emotional way reminded me that in moments of crisis or the aftermath of trauma or in the midst of grief, people become unrecognizable to themselves. Sometimes this happens like me and we find ourselves needing to control everything and anything in order to trick ourselves into thinking we are completely safe. Other times this happens because other times it happens in the way that we go numb. We shrink down our emotions and we cease to feel sadness, anger, grief, shame. And we do this in a way to just lessen all of those emotions, but what actually ends up happening is we end up not feeling our joy or our excitement or amazement either. Some of us, we find ourselves getting angry all the time, angry at the big things, angry at the small things, and angry at everything in between. The list of how we react goes on and on and on, but what is clear in these moments is that the world shifts. It shifts from being a place of community and connection and joy into being a place where all of a sudden it is me against everyone and everything. Or, as Dr. Bessel van der Kolk says, trauma turns the whole world into a gathering of aliens. Our world shifts. It's unknown, unsafe, untrustworthy. And all of a sudden the question becomes, how do I learn to trust myself or anyone ever again? 
Interestingly, the answer to this question, the Jewish answer to this question, is the book of Lamentations. Lamentations scholar Adele Berlin writes that the destruction of the city and temple was an unprecedented event, and as a result, a new genre arose to fill a new need. This genre? Lamentations. The art and wisdom of grieving. Now, you might be saying, okay, great, those are some nice words, the art and wisdom of grieving. How on earth is that supposed to answer the question, how do I learn to trust myself or others again? Well, I spent some time talking to Reverend Sherry Coleman, who is a chaplain at the VA hospital in Loma Linda. She was my supervisor and mentor while I worked there. And she explains that trauma causes a person to sink into themselves to distance themselves from people, and to label everyone as unsafe and untrustworthy. But lament, on the other hand, says, I'm terrified, I'm grieving, I'm scared, but I am going to reach out to another human anyways. Lament recognizes that healing happens in community, or, as Sherry Coleman says, Lament is an act of defiance against trauma. In moments of crisis or in the aftermath of trauma, in spaces of grief, to lament is an act of vulnerability and courage as the person reaches towards community for healing. Dr. Van der Kolk writes, traumatized human beings recover in the context of relationships. With families, loved ones, AA meetings, veterans organizations, religious communities, or professional therapists. And the role of these relationships is to provide physical and emotional safety, including safety from feeling shamed, admonished, or judged, and to bolster the courage to tolerate, face, and process the reality of what's happened. Recovery from trauma involves reconnecting with our fellow human beings. This means that there are two parts to a lament. The first part is the person lamenting, which we've already noted is both an act of defiance against trauma and an act of vulnerability and courage. But then there's this second, often forgotten, often neglected part, the witness the person who holds the space for the person lamenting. And in this grief illiterate society that we live in, it is the second role of witness that we are really, really, really bad at. Now don't get me wrong, grief is uncomfortable. I think we can all agree grief is uncomfortable. Hearing stories like the stories in Lamentations 4 about mothers boiling their children, children not having any water to, to, uh, to calm their parched tongues, reading of the people who are clinging to ash heaps, those stories are uncomfortable. Stories of loss, stories of trauma is like a mirror that reflects back to us our own painful histories or terrifying fears. These stories remind us that reality is not always sunshine and rainbows and butterflies. And as a result, these stories are uncomfortable. So in this grief illiterate society, when we are confronted with a person in our presence who who is grieving, our first reaction to help them is to get them past their sadness and back to happy as quickly as possible. And we do this in phrases such as, don't cry, everything's gonna be okay. Or, I know it doesn't make sense right now, but God has a plan. (laughs) Or, look at it this way, enter silver lining phrase here. Or, you're strong, you'll make it through this, you'll be okay. Or, simply the desire and need to fill the silence with words. When we say this, when we say things like this, when we do things like this, we deny the person the physical and emotional safety that is so critical for their healing. 
What we, instead, what we are actually doing is we are judging them, shaming them, admonishing them for having the audacity to experience grief. We are invalidating their pain. We are telling them that their whole person isn't welcome here. Come back when you're happy and more palatable. To refuse a person the opportunity to lament, to grieve with you, is to deny them the very community they need to heal. And therefore, it is an act of violence against their very soul. It tells them, your grief makes me uncomfortable. And my comfort is more important than actually witnessing your grief and being with you in your pain. When the Jewish people added Lamentations 4 and all of the other poems of Lamentation to their canon, they did so recognizing that they needed to name the horrors of the Jerusalem siege. They needed to name the dehydration. They needed to name the starvation. They needed to name the death, the cannibalization, the loss, the grief, the dehumanization. They needed to name it all in order to heal and to grow as a people. Their literature was missing this art of lament. And they knew if they didn't learn and practice this art, a huge portion of the human experience with each other and with God would go unacknowledged and be denied. A devastating loss to any community or person of faith. To be a witness to someone's grief and lament is a holy thing. When I worked in the VA at the hospital as a hospital chaplain, they have a tradition there. They have a tradition there called the Honor Walk. The Honor Walk is given for any veteran who dies, and when the veteran dies, the nurses prep the body and place an American flag over their body. And an announcement goes out throughout the entire hospital, on our walk in 10 minutes. And then a chaplain leads a procession from the now deceased patient's room to the morgue. And it goes chaplain, followed by the body and the nurses who have cared for that veteran, followed by the family and friends and anyone else who wants to join. The walls are lined with medical staff, administrators, other veterans who are patients and visitors. And as the body passes by, those who have served in the army salute, or military salute, and those who have not placed their hands on their heart. It's very slow. All you can hear are footsteps, some sobs occasionally, but it is incredibly moving, and each and every time, I ended up crying. Now, the walk itself is moving, but the most, I think, emotional, impactful, and meaningful aspect of this honor walk wasn't actually the walk itself, but was actually the hour or two that I had to spend with the families right before the walk. Now, as a hospital chaplain, sometimes I'm in the room as the family receives the news from the doctor that their loved one has passed away. Sometimes I'm there just shortly afterwards, but either way, within a few minutes of a patient's death, I am in a room with a grieving family. And I always end up saying the only thing I know how to say in that situation, which is, I'm sorry, I'm so, so, so sorry for your loss. And I invite them to sit. And inevitably, the silence settles in. But there is a lot happening in that silence. Sometimes you see it on their face as they're actively processing the fact that their loved one has died. Sometimes you see it in their body and hear it in their voices as they sit there crying and sobbing. Sometimes there's hardly any movement as the person sits there zoned out deep in their thoughts. But I learned that whatever is happening in that silence needs to happen and I learned to wait until eventually, and they always did, eventually they would speak. 
Sometimes it was a minute, sometimes it was a three minutes, and sometimes it was an eternal 10 minutes of silence. But eventually they all spoke and it always went something like this. They would shake their heads and be like, I'm so sorry, I, I don't know what to say. To which I would respond, it's okay. You're not doing anything wrong, you're okay. Can I ask though, can you tell me about your loved one? And this was like the magic question stories would come and come and overflowing. Sometimes you'd get the best stories. One of my favorite stories was this 80-year-old veteran who had just passed away who woke up one day and said, to hell with being old, I'm going to buy a motorcycle. And he went to a Harley Davidson store, bought a motorcycle, and that day, that very same day with a brand new Harley Davidson motorcycle, set off on a road trip by himself across the entire continental U.S., leaving his family in absolute terror that this 80-year-old man is driving across the continental, ter- uh, continental U.S. on a motorcycle by himself. But also, a little bit awestruck at the audacity of this man who's 80, thinking he's 18 years old at heart. Other times, you'd get heartbreaking stories, like a son whose father had just passed away. And he explains that his father had abandoned him when, it, when he was a kid but he had just recently returned in his life and taken up heartily the role of grandfather to his own kids. And he lamented and he said, I was just learning what kind of father my dad could have been for me. Other times you get stories of love in which a woman whose husband died And she explains, I've been with him since I was 16 years old, nearly 50 years at that point. And she goes on and tells the story. It's an incredibly epic love story of how they met when they were moody and rebellious teenagers and stuck it out through all the hormones and life changes and ended up getting married and were green newlyweds all the way until they were aging and all the barrage of health scares that happened. And now, after half a century, she is facing a world without him alone for the first time. These hours were filled with grief, with tears, with anger, with laughter, with amazement, with regret, with love, with loss. But in these spaces of lament, I had this incredible honor of witnessing all of it. I watched as these spaces of immense and unimaginable pain became spaces of deep and meaningful and sacred connection. We cried, we ached, we mourned together. I experienced this on a personal level with my own family recently. After a few years of failing health, Joe's grandma, my mother-in-law's only living parent passed away. We were hanging out with each other when we received a call at 8 p.m. And the only thing we heard was Joe's mom as she said, my mom is dead. And the line goes quiet. We grabbed our keys, we headed over to the house, and there the entire family surrounded Joe's mom as she cried and cried and cried. And for four hours, we heard story after story of Joe's mom, Joe's mom's mom, Lola Anna. We heard as Joe's mom explained that she was the youngest of four and she, and as a result, she grew up right at the side of her mom, doing everything and learning everything her mom did. Learning how to make gluten in the kitchen, learning how to haggle at the markets in the Philippines, learning how to manage a household budget. I can't even believe it. A child learning how to manage a household budget. And then later years, how her mom became so much more than a mom, but became a friend and a talking partner and a spiritual mentor as they talked about God's love and the power of prayer the beauty of a relationship with the divine. 
we listened as she cried and she spoke of the immense loss that happened when her mom no longer remembered who she was and the hole that that left in her heart because she no longer had that connection or that friendship. We listened, we listened as she talked about her mom and gratitude that at least she had passed away being surrounded by family and friends. She cried, she laughed, she mourned. We witnessed it all and we did it with her. The next afternoon, my mother-in-law called me and she said, Mandy, you know what is really surprising? I slept so soundly throughout the entire night. And she said, I think it's because you guys listened to me and let me cry. In the midst of grief and loss, in the midst of horrible stories, Lamentations 4 teaches us first that it is not only okay, but critical that we are deeply honest about the horrors, the painful stories, and the unimaginable losses in our life. But what it also teaches us is that it's sacred to be a witness, to hold space for another's lament, because in doing so, this brings community and healing to unimaginably painful and difficult stories. Sarah Bessie, an author, writes, not offer opinions with those who weep, not justify and speculate with those who weep, not center my own self with those who weep, not what about with those who weep. God Almighty, until we learn to weep with those who weep, what are we even doing? To sit with another's lament, holding their pain, naming abuse, grieving loss, hearing stories of trauma is to say, you're not alone. I know that this world has betrayed and abandoned you. I know that you want nothing more than to sink into yourself and to disappear, but I see you. I see your pain, I feel your pain, I hold your pain. You are not alone because I'm with you. May Lamentations 4 teach us in a moment of another grief to let go of our need for answers, to let go of our need of comfort, to let go of our need for silver linings and instead step in with our entire beings into that person's lament so that they may never may so that they may know that they are never alone and can experience the healing power of a 